I'm here at the ASPO USA conference with Robert Rapier, and Robert is well known in the ASPO community as a very intelligent person, and so we're just going to have a bit of a conversation with him about you know, what he knows and, and what he might be able to share with us. So my first question is, what interests you in this topic at all? I mean, I think for, for any of us, we're interested in it because we want to know, you know, we want to be able to plan for the future. And especially for, for me with kids, this is when I became How many kids really, do you have? I've got three children. I've got a 17-year-old daughter who's off to college next year, and a 15-year-old son and a 9-year-old son. And when my daughter was born, uh, I was in graduate school, and I was actually working on renewable energy at that time, and that's when I started to become really interested in peak oil. So that would be, uh, you know, 17, 18 years ago that I really started, and the first time I heard of, uh, you know, Hubbard's Curve and, and uh, I really started looking into that. And I, I became concerned that, uh, you know, about the risk. Not that next year, you know, we're going to fall off a cliff and we're going to live in caves and, you know, some of the, some of the dire predictions, but that, uh, you know, our economy runs on oil and the global economy runs on oil and oil moves food around. And, and what's going to happen is that becomes unaffordable. And, you know, over the years, I, I, uh, in 2007, I came up with this uh, hypothesis, the long recession, after Jim Kunstler's The Long Emergency, a book I read, and, uh, you know, it, it alarmed me quite a bit. I said, uh, you know, oil prices historically, you know, preceded most of the recessions. High spike oil prices, you know, disposable income goes up. I mean, it goes down because they're having to spend more money on energy, and we go into a recession. And as oil prices started to climb, you know, from 2000 and 2005, and they continued to go up, I said, you know, what happens if we slide into a recession? China's, of course, growing like crazy, and oil prices push us into a recession, but then it's not like it's ever been before because we don't have so much excess capacity as we had before, and we, the, the price doesn't crash and allow us to recover from recession. So I said, what happens is the long recession where you don't come out of recession easily, and, and I don't see an easy path even right now. How do we come out of recession when oil prices are still hanging around at recession-inducing levels, and yet China is still growing, and they're still buying oil, and they're, they're, they're going to continue consuming more oil, and so our economy is strangling without an easy, you know, without an easy way out. If oil prices would fall back into $30, I think we'd come out of recession, but I can't see a scenario about which that happens. In the media, many people talk about the recession being due to um, too much public debt or maybe too much private debt or a bubble in the housing market. What is your perspective on that? Certainly, I think uh, if oil prices had stayed low, I think we'd probably still go into recession. Um, I think the, the housing bubble and the, the easy credit is a very large component of the recession. But if you do the math and you say, you know, energy prices spiked up in 2008, how much did the average person have to pay for energy relative to what they were paying two years earlier? It's a fairly respectable amount. It's like, uh, so it's like a stealth tax that they got no benefit from. So, you know, I, I've done the calculation before, and, and for most families... A tax from the oil A tax owners. From, from the... <laughs> exactly. Um, and, and in many cases, outside the country. You know, those are, those are who are benefiting. And I did the calculation before and said that, uh, you know, the average family is paying, you know, a, hundred, a few hundred dollars to a few thousand dollars per year more, and we're already, we have no savings. I mean, we're already living paycheck to paycheck. Our savings rate is very low. So I'd say even without high oil prices, we'd slip into rece uh, recession because of the housing bubble. But without the housing bubble, I think we slip into recession anyway because they, they're, more of their disposable income is gone. And when their disposable income is gone, they have less money to spend on other things. So I think the oil piece of it has not gotten enough credit. But going forward, I, I think maybe government is still baffled as to why you know we've not come out of this recession and not enough attention is being paid to well, you know, I saw a statistic the other day that over 50% of the stocks that trade on the S&P 500 have energy as their number one input. Well, I mean, that explains a lot of why it's uh, very difficult to, uh, to, to come out of this recession. And, uh, 
you know, barring some unforeseen, you know, huge discovery, collapse in China, you know, something that really takes demand down or increases supply, I, th I think we're in for a long, rough, difficult period here. So how does this long, rough, difficult period play out in people's lives, family, family lives? I think that, um, you know, it, it, people are, unemployment's gonna continue to remain high. Um, you know, people are going to lose jobs, people are going to struggle. Um, you know, my family asked me a few years ago, they said, well, you know, what can we do? And I said, get very fuel efficient. Try, like try to minimize. Your brothers and sisters. And yeah, I ha actually had a, a kind of a meeting with the family. In, uh, like you called the meeting and said. It was Christmas, and I said, I said, listen, I, I want to talk to you about something I think is important. Um, I was said, that difficult to come to that decision to sit down with them? They know they knew where I stood, but I've never really just bluntly said, "Look, here's a threat," and uh, regardless of whether the threat materializes soon. If you get as energy efficient as you can and minimize the energy inputs into your life, you're going to be a lot better off. I mean, you're going to have more money and you're going to be at less risk. So it's like I advise them, you know, get, get more fuel efficient car. Anytime you can get, uh, you know, when you have to replace your hot water heater, get as fuel efficient as you possibly can. Um, and so th that was my advice and that's my advice to people is be thinking about what happens to you if you have to pay twice as much for gasoline, I mean, how can you structure your life so that that doesn't impact you quite so much? And uh, so I think it's, it's going to hurt people. It's hurting people now. Um, on the one hand, it's making us become more fuel efficient. I mean, our oil consumption has dropped, I think, a million and a half barrels. In the U.S.? In the U.S. over the past, I think that's 2006 to that's 2010. What? 10%, 5%? Yeah, it's about 10%. It's about it's maybe, um, I think we were using about 20, and we're using maybe 18 or so now. I think, I think those are roughly the correct numbers. Um, but during the same time period that ours went down 1.5 million barrels, China and India alone went up 2.2 million barrels. So they're stealing our oil. So they're, I mean, <laughs> the, what we saved, you know, didn't cause oil prices to crumble like it would have in the past. You know, most cases when the recession comes, our demand goes down, and we were the largest uh, consumer of oil in the world, and so that affected global prices, and not this time. I mean, we did go to $147 and it pulled back from that, but, you know, we're still $80, $90 oil. Historically, that's a horror story for the economy. So you have three children. How do you talk to them about the future? Yeah, normally, you know, it, it's difficult because uh, kids don't aren't thinking about this. I mean, when I'm this age, I'm not thinking about this. Um, you know, it's there, there's a disconnect. I see this, you know, with my daughter sometimes who thinks uh, she's 17. She's 17, and she would consider herself an environmentalist, and all her friends are considered consider themselves environmentalists. And you know, you ask them, they'll say down with oil and so forth and so on. And then I'll come into a room and all the lights will be on, TV will be on, and the, and the radio will be on. And I say, you know, you're not making the connection here. Especially here in Hawaii where our, our electricity is produced from oil. When you leave all those things on, that's a real world impact that you're totally disconnected from. It takes more oil now to run all these things. And I've said before, we're, we're all disconnected from the, the, the fuel that we put in our cars we're totally disconnected from what happens and, and all the implications of that. You know, um, you know, was the was the, the delta in Nigeria was it polluted as a result of that? Yes, I mean to some extent. Um, you know, the BP blowout. We're all responsible for that to some extent uh, because it's our demand that causes them to go out and, and do these things. So yeah, but with kids, you know, I go up and I talk to the school sometimes, and, and you can see that they get it, but it's gone pretty quickly. I mean, energy is not their problem, it's their parents' problem until they're out in the world and they're actually having to pay for it, and I think security. But I think that's why most of us do what we do, because we look at our kids and we think, we don't want our life, their lives to be harder than our lives were. And I wonder sometimes if that won't be the case, that um, we're consuming their resources, um, we're, we're, we're putting them deeply in debt, and I think it's grossly unfair what we're doing to the kids and uh, that's 
one of the main reasons that I do what I do. So like I said, when my daughter was born, that's when I really started thinking about the future and the world and uh, the world she was going to inherit. And I said, you know, I've got to do something. I've got to, and, and I started writing after I read The Long Emergency. I said, you know what? I cannot, I, I cannot allow a world like this to happen. This is horrible. Um, you know, the, the, the world that Jim describes, you think, I never want to see that happen. You never want to see, you know, people starving to death or freezing to death, and you say, I'll do whatever I can to make sure that doesn't happen. And that's why we get together for things like this. You know, there's a hope that if we beat the podium and we talk enough, we can move policies in a more sustainable direction. You write primarily and publish to the oil drum, is that right? Um, I, I've got a blog called R Squared, and, and I put up like two articles a week maybe. I occasionally publish at the oil drum. I used to publish a lot more at the oil drum. Um, I write, and, you know, sometimes I, I, I've written you know, four blogs a day, and so for the oil drum, that's no good. There's a lot of yeah. authors there. So my blog is my more creative outlet where if I want to write four things a day, I'll, I'll write four things a day. There. Is it typically about oil, or what are you writing about? It's, it's energy in general. Um, sometimes it's about oil, sometimes it's about alternative energy. Uh, occasionally I will dip my toe into climate change, although that debate is just so bitter and so, uh, you know, divisive, I normally just stay out of that. You know, I did mention in my presentation yesterday, people don't like it to see, you know, in fact, in the last 10 years, carbon emissions in the United States and in the European Union have declined and they've skyrocketed uh, in, in uh, Asia Pacific. and. As I'm, I'm writing a book right now, it should come out sometime next year, and I just wrote the chapter on climate change, and I, I, I backed out, I said, what if the U.S. and EU emissions went to zero? It would only take us back to 1994 levels of emissions, and they would still be rapidly increasing. So my conclusion is, I don't see a viable way to rein in global carbon emissions. And, uh, you know, I tell that to people and they said, well, you're saying we should just give up. And I said, no, I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm just making an observation. Um, I would never suggest that we give up. Um, I continue to try. I, I devote my efforts to energy, which indirectly affects the, uh, the carbon dioxide. Um, but that's a global problem. And I can't really control what China uses. I can't control what India uses. And because they use so little oil relative to us, two barrels per person in China, 23 for us, I can only see them growing and continue to put pressure on oil prices and they're, they're continuing to build coal-fired power plants, so I think their emissions will continue to grow. So how does one, um, how does one address the climate change problem then if you can't do it at home? I, I think um, that's really a difficult, I, I don't see a, an effective way to address it because of the global nature of the problem. Jeff Rubin made a suggestion. He said, uh, if you put carbon tariffs on countries like China, where they produce GDP much less efficiently than we do, then you can start to incentivize them to become more energy efficient. But still, the people there, they want a higher quality of life. People in India want a better standard of living. It's hard to see how they actually go down you know, in, in energy consumption. You know, A lot of people make the point that China has invested a lot of money into renewable energy. And that's true, but they're also investing, you know, heavily into coal, and they're investing in they're investing in everything. So while their renewable energy uh, total production goes up, their overall carbon emissions do too, because they're they're investing in every sector. What is uh, what is your most positive hope for the future? Realistic, though. <laughs> Yeah, that, see, that's the problem. That was uh, one of my slides is the idealistic future versus what I think is going to happen. Uh, you know, I think we will end up burning up all the carbon that we can burn up. I think everything that we can get our hands on, we're gonna, we're gonna burn it up. So I think realistically, you know, the tipping point that they talk about in the atmosphere at 450 ppm, I, I think we reach that. My, my best hope is that the, uh, the consequences of that are not as severe as some people project. That's my hope. Um, I, I acknowledge it is a very serious threat. Um, I understand why there's, a, uh, why there's a greenhouse effect. I understand that CO2 going up should cause the global temperature to go up. I just hope we don't get into the sort of runaway situation that some people have predicted. 
So that's my best hope. Um, I think oil prices, as, as they're high, they're hurting people, but they're also forcing people to move to more sustainable uh, uh, living, to reduce their energy consumption. More people ride the bus, more people take mass transit. So it encourages a lot of the things that, uh, that we need to do in the long term. All right. Well, thank you very much for talking to us today. You bet. Robert Rapier, and the blog was? R squared. R squared. If you Google my name, you'll find it. It's the top hit. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining us again today, and see you next time.